name is Kyodea and I work at Ventures Platform. Um, we're happy to have everyone join the webinar today. Um, and we're also happy to have our invited guests um, on the webinar today. Um, without further ado, we'll just kickstart um, the program. Um, once again, we're happy to have everyone join this webinar. Um, thank you for taking our time from your busy schedules to join us today. I'm sure it's gonna be super useful to specifically to founders really looking at you know um, selling to the enterprise and expanding geographically. Um, so the conversation with is a quarterly webinar we have as a firm, right? Um, and the way we typically arrive at topics is founders usually reach out to us on various topics in the course of the month and the quarter, you know, various challenges they're having. And so we basically use some of those um, data points to form um, a basis for the, the topic we're going to be having. So in recent time, we've had founders reach out to us on oh, how to think about you know, um, selling to big enterprise and expanding, you know, to other countries. Um, and again, we felt we were better to talk about this in our network than Olumide, whose company is currently in about five um, African countries, right? So um, today we're super happy to have Olumide joining us. I'm just gonna work us through what an agenda looks like. Um, we should be done in about an hour, 30 minutes. Um, the way this is gonna work is um, Olumide is gonna be up pretty shortly um, and it's gonna give a presentation. He has this really interesting presentation I think uh, we would all love to see. Um, that's gonna happen for about 25 to 30 minutes. Um, and thereafter, I'm gonna have a 15 to 20 minutes fireside chat with Olumide um, where we, I just ask a bunch of questions to further clarify some of the things he has mentioned. And thereafter, um, it, the, the floor is gonna be open to the audience to ask questions. Um, for the Q&A with the audience, the way it's going to work is um, all you need to do is just type your questions within the chat bar and we'll pick it up from there and obviously push the questions to Olubide to get his thoughts and answers around those questions. Um, again, if there's any feedback, if there's any, anything you'd like us to note within the webinar, feel free to also drop your comments and questions or feedback and suggestions within the, within the comments bar, right? Um, and yeah, uh, we guess I guess we can dive in. So. Olumide, I mean, for, for a lot of people within the startup ecosystem in Nigeria and generally in Africa, I guess Olumide needs no introduction. Is that they call him the, the Baba Saleh, the silent angel that has, that has written checks for so many companies. But more importantly, um, he's a founder also himself, right? Um, he runs blue chip technology and they provide a lot of infrastructural support and software support to big enterprises, um, not just in Nigeria, but in five other African countries, right? Um, and he's gonna be sharing some of his insights, you know, on how they're able to do that. Um, again, anybody that's tried expanding outside of Nigeria know that it's super hard just like spreading across Africa, regulations, um, um, cultural context, you know, getting the right talent to work with, and there are a bunch of things, you know, and Olumide is gonna be sharing some of his perspective as to how um, they have been able to navigate that, you know, and some of the suggestions as to how other companies can also approach it, right? So without um, further ado, I guess, <laughs> Um, let's welcome uh, Olubide Shoyombo, um, founder of Blue Chip Technology and one of Nigeria's most prolific in Indian investor. Hey, thank you, Kari. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Do I need to put my video on? Yes, please, sir. All right. Hello, everyone, and it's good to be here. I'm going to share my screen and then we can start. Tyler, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Great, yeah, okay. perfect. All right, um, so again, good afternoon, everyone. It feels good to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about selling to enterprises and regional expansion. I'm going to make this very, very different because um, like Kadi said, it's, I try to avoid many of this, um, talks, webinars, and events. I just try and do my things behind, but because Ventures Platform is family, I had no choice but to, but to come out. Um, so this will not be any of those aspire and aspire rubbish. Because I remember I was, at, um, I was at an event once and someone was asking me, um, what's our last passing line? I was expecting some quotable quote and I just gave him my phone number. Um, because I find that you can, Instead of all those generic things, working with founders um, in closer settings, in closer groups, uh, you tend to find more impact that way. Um, 
you would also not be talking about um, some of the typical sales management things you might have learned in business school. Um, we'll talk more about the soft side of selling and some of the things that are found on the streets in, in Lagos and across Africa. All right. Um, so starting out, um, some people on the call might have or might know my story. I've told it a couple of times and I even mentioned that this at some TED talk um, I did. Um, I started Blue Chip Technologies with a gentleman called Kazim in, in 2008. And um, it was a very interesting one because I was, what, 24, 25 at the time. And um, we're thinking of starting this enterprise applications company that would build out data warehouse, business intelligence solutions, and business applications for the telcos and the banks and most of the tier one organization. Uh, but we didn't have any money. Um, so we went to my dad, he gave us 5 million naira, he took 50% of the company. Yes, my own father took 50% of my own company, but we signed a share buyback agreement um, that allowed us to buy back our shares. And I think um, we're, able to buy, we're able to buy those shares back in November or December of that same year. And I think because selling to enterprises could be very rewarding early on when it works, um, was why we're able to do that. And the check you actually see on the screen right now is, is the first check we ever, ever cashed. This was a check, I think it was, yes, 2008, 14.05. And it was a check from a company called CFS West Africa. And imagine a company at the time, Blue Chip had, um, we got a call saying um, a company was looking for a data warehouse and business intelligence consultants um, to to deliver to deliver um, an application for them, and so we our office was our Nikon at the time. We quickly got on the road, jumped in Alcada, got this office in VI, and found out that um, they got me into the room to meet the panel, and they told Kazim to wait outside. So apparently they were actually hiring. So they started asking me about what school did I go to, what did I finish with in school. And I quickly found out that they were hiring for a business intelligence developer, not a company. But quickly, um, I changed the topic and let them know that, hey, um, we're, we're blue chip technologies, we're a company and we can outsource a developer to you. My partner is even outside, so they brought Kazim in. And we we're able to convince the company to hire a developer from us. The only problem was that we didn't have any, we didn't have any developer at the time. It was just two of us. Uh, but we're able to tell them that we can outsource the developer to them. We'll provide backing to that developer at the background. But then something came up and then they asked, where have you done this before? And this is really what founders find, um, especially starting out. People start asking you for references um, before you get a job, when you actually need a job to have a reference or when you actually need a project to have a reference. So what I've found as a good hack for this is to refer to your experience or the consultant's experience. So at the time, we'll say things like um, the consultants at Blue Chip have X, Y, and Z experience, or the consultants at Blue Chip have worked on so so and so project. Um, so even though it's not Blue Chip directly, but the consultants in that company, that also helps with some reference check. So at the end of the day, we had to, um, they gave us the job, we hired, we found someone to hire, a guy called Kunle, uh, was uh, staff 001 in technical terms. Um, and we um, prepped him over the weekend and outsourced him to this client. And um, that was how we started. So this was the first ever check um, we collected, what, 12 years ago. And it's very interesting to see that the company that started out as, um, as something, as a, as a dream, really, and starting out with 350000 naira um, as a first check is now doing upwards of $50 million a year. Um, so building a sales organization, it's, um, first starts with you, the founder, who are you? Are you a, do you consider yourself a, a farmer or a hunter? And, um, sorry, let's see. And who's the hunter? Um, I like this, I like this line from Jay-Z a lot because it says, if the hunter cares about it just got about large money, like if you saying about large money, what's the point? Why are we here? Because many times you find out that 
the effort to close a $1 million deal and the effort to close a $10 million deal is even, isn't much different. It's the same thing in many cases. So why are you hustling with, with that small $1 million? That's how the hunter thinks. He thinks about, if it's not about large money, what's the point? The guy also loves the thrill of the chase. Um, they like that competition. They like when they beat when it be is keenly contested, because that's when the dynamics change, that's when it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you find out that these hunters, I, I identify myself as mainly a hunter. Um, we hate, they hate proposal writing and all the paperwork because they find out that it slows them down. They just want to be in the streets and sell. They're also very independent and self-driven, so they're able to um, build out themselves. You find out that many hunter-type salesmen um, also go ahead to build um, this kind of organizations where everybody is, is pushing out. And you need a mix of both the hunter and the farmer. So on the farmer, on the other hand, on the other end, is the one thinking, hey, the one I have must not spoil. I must, um, I must build, I must build, I must keep this same customer because I can sell more things to this customer. And you also need this kind of guys in the, in the enterprise, in enterprise sales, because you find out that even in enterprise sales, even though you have a huge top line, like even if I look at blue chip today, um, about 70 or 80 percent of our revenues would probably come from about maybe five or six clients. So you need to keep you need to keep those clients very happy, and that's where the farmer the farmer type personality comes because they manage the customer experience better. They like the paperwork. They are following up their starting out with yourself as a founder is to think about the type of personalities and the type of salespeople you want to bring um, in terms of building in building out the organization. All right, let's talk about some of my lessons from the street. Um, the first would be showing respect uh, because obviously in Nigeria, our cultural values emphasize that. And when I mean respect, it's not just respect for people with authorities. It's greeting everyone from the guy at the security post to the receptionist, to the cleaners, everybody, and showing that level of respect. Because I found that even when we started out very early, I told you, I started out when I was, what, 24, 25. And greeting those people made them feel, made some of those guys feel special. And many times when you don't have appointments, it's those same guys that will let you into the building. You can imagine trying to get into some head offices of some banks without an invitation. Um, knowing the security and receptionist helps you in getting through the door and then showing them respect makes them happy about that. Also listen, listen a lot, even when you don't agree with what the person of authority is saying, a rude interjection and your deal might just go belly up. Um, socializing, um, this is my favorite pastime. <laughs> um, you find out that uh, the salesman's job doesn't end when the, when at, the, at 5 p.m. Um, because a salesman is only as good as his network. Um, and you find out that this networking happens outside the office. So um, for me today, it's Lagos Polo Club. But then those days it used to be yellow chili happy hour every, every other day, trying to network and trying to build that relationship. And you find out that um, businesses strive on relationships, right? And the best relationships are personal. So it's... It's not far-fetched to find me in a wedding or in a burial ceremony of a client's father in Abraka or in Ugeli um, just to build that same network. So if you're a salesman and you're in, you're in the office, especially if you're a hunter, um, you're doing, you doing things wrong because you need, you need to be out there um, because that's how you become top of mind. Um, lessons from the street, constant communication. Um, it's, it's a difficult one because many times salespeople get accused of of, um, of only calling when they want to sell something. So how do you keep that communication still fresh even when you're not selling? And this is where building that relationship with the customer is very good and being in constant communication so that you don't get things like, hey, now you want to sell, you remember me. And I took this lesson from, from some of my domestic workers and even People I know, the chat that you see on, the, on your screen is actually one between me and a bouncer at 57. And the guy sends me a message every Sunday, happy Sunday, sir, happy Sunday. 
my guy, I greet you. And then the messages get too much one time. I know he's looking for money, and I just said, hey, I've sent you 50K. Because you find out that because the guy has always been in my face and, and kept that constant communication, um, I always remembered him. So always keeping in contact with your clients, even if it's with relevant news, you find out that the guy is a Tottenham fan, or you find out that the guy is a, is a, is a, is a crypto head, and you send, him, you send him relevant news along those things. You don't have to sell every time. You, you keep the line fresh for the time you want. So by the time you want to sell, or by the time there's an opportunity on the table, it's not about, hey, you just remembered us today. Okay? Sorry. Um, lessons from the street also finding common ground. Um, before I get into any prospect or get into any account, I try and find out a little, a little more things about the organization, about the procurement manager, about the CEO, or about whoever I'm meeting to find out what school, what ethnicity. Um, like I can remember I had met a I'd met a procurement manager once, and after a few meetings, I found out the guy obviously was a, was a Benin man, and I was born in Benin. And then the next thing I entered, I was saying, what year, or you say, and speaking his language at the end of that meeting, it, it draws you closer to be able to close. Um, so finding a common thing, I know the King's College old boys here, I'm not one. Um, they find, you see them, maybe they find any King's College guy, they're shouting, Florian, Florian. I've been, in a, I've been in a room with Bukola Saraki before, and I almost outset Florian just because I was trying to. I was trying to. I mean, it usually helps. Um, it can be anything, and use that to draw closer to, to close. Um, this is a funny one because people always say the market is big enough, and I just look at them in a funny way because many times, especially in the enterprise space and selling to enterprises, the market isn't really big enough. Right? Many people say it, but they don't really mean it. <laughs> and um, you find out that many large ticket items in enterprises are bought only once. A customer is only going to buy one ERP system, for example, or a bank is only going to buy one ERP application. A customer who processes payments um, might So, because um, many times you find that you might have the relationship in an, in an account, but you don't have, your offering is not right up the alley of what the client wants. Or in some cases, you don't even have the relationship. Someone else has it. And in those cases, obviously, um Uh, I think we lost Olumide for a bit there. Hi, Olumide. You're muted. No? Yeah, we Can lost you for, you no. yeah, for like a minute. Your network was, was teaching, was breaking. All right, sorry. Let me share my screen again. Okay, can my screen again? Sorry, are we good now? Yes, um, I think we can hear you and we can see your screen. All right, so I was speaking about um, the former NMPC boss who, who said about $9.8 million and was given as gifts in in the oil and gas sector to him for contracts awarded. And if you know anything about the oil and gas sector in Nigeria, it's probably more even perfect. 
him giving approvals and people coming back to say thank you. But then it's illegal, especially when you're building, you're building a company for the long term. Um, you find out that if you're trying to, people who would jump into scenarios like this, uh, I easily what I call briefcase companies and willing and dealing guys. Um, and you get you get caught up into that into that um, into that web, and it's it's difficult to get out. Um, so for me, it's how to give ethically. Um, so what you see on the other side of your screen would be little things around souvenirs, around um, branded items that keep you top of mind with the client. So imagine the client has your mug every day when he's when he's when he's having his coffee. It's very likely that that client will remember you when there is an RFP, or he doesn't. It's very. It becomes harder for him to forget you. Um, so you, you become top of mind um, for those for those customers. Um, in terms of expansion into um, new regions, so Blue Chip today is in Zambia, DRC, Kenya, Ghana. And why did we go? Why did we? so? Before you even think about going into this market, ask yourself why, right? You are still there's still a huge market to capture in our there's still a huge market to capture in our uh, even locally, and you're already thinking about thinking about Ghana, or you're already thinking about Cotonou, or you're already thinking about Cameroon. You've not even conquered your own market yet. Um, but then, I also, while I say that, I also understand that some opportunities might be opportunistic. Uh, for example, we opened up in Zambia um, in 2000, late 2008, going into 2009, where it was opportunistic from the sense that we had a we had a project with one of the telcos there. So somebody who had worked with us in the past and knew what we could deliver was now in Zambia. He needed people who could also deliver the same thing, and then he called us in, and it was opportunistic. In this day, we started with one client. And try to build it out to um, use that as a base to build out other um, other 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 opportunities. So in those cases, it's just opportunistic. It wasn't it wasn't strategic. Um, but our our inroad into Kenya, for example, was much strategic because we are seeing the huge gap in the market. We are seeing the appreciation for um, the the Kenyan market appreciation for paying well for services, and we decided to go after that market, which meant um, putting in a lot of funding into building out the right organization, hiring out the right people, and finding the local partners. Um, especially coming out from Nigeria, you find out that there are many common themes around, hey, these Nigerians have come again. Um, so you need, to find a, you need to find a face that's the face of your company um, and is a local um, who have skin in the game and who your headquarters company or your your main company can then provide backing and go into those markets with the face of a local with the face of a local partner. So that's what we've done in in the likes of Kenya and in the likes of DLC. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. I'll take some questions. When the deal closes, you'll be like my man, like my man FF, sipping on and enjoying the gelato. Thank you very much. Howdy. Thanks, Olumide. Um, it was it was that was, was that was really really useful. Um, I mean, I think for me, if a few things stood out, right? I mean, the first is just being top of mind in terms of like relating with partners. So that's that regular updates, you know, sharing points of finding points of interest, sharing updates. And not being salesy, you know, just coming when you when you have a deal to close. I think for me that was like super important, right? Um, and and in terms of just in, in terms of in terms of also in terms of you know being friendly with everybody. I mean, I have a personal experience back some 10, 15 years ago. I used to do like a sales job, right? Where I used to basically sell uh, books office to office in VI, right? And and I remember that one, one of the one of the key tenets of the training was whenever you get to any office, just ensure that you greet the guards, right? And so Absolutely. in the offices where 
they typically say strangers are not welcome. Once you greet the guy, the guy says, ah, I know why Ogawe go like this thing. You know? Me, I go knock on your office. And legit, the guy literally takes you from office to office, yep. right? He has no context what you're selling, right? So uh, I, I think that's also quite, quite useful. Um, I mean, a bun bunch of questions are coming in, but before I begin to take those questions, I'm just going to ask you a few questions, uh, sure. just also deep dive into some of the things you have mentioned. So please, everyone, just if you have questions, please drop them on the Q&A. Um, just so we're able to aggregate all the questions, let, can we just use the Q&A instead of using the chat? I see that people are dropping questions on both the chat and the Q&A. We can, we can use the chat for feedback and use the Q&A for questions, right? Just so we're able to capture um, every question. So Olumide, I'm, I'm curious as to, I mean, you've talked about 50M in annual ref, that's, 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 that's gangster, right? Uh, so now we now know why you're the true Babasane, eh? <laughs> and you have to do give away for boys, eh? <laughs> so, so, so I'm curious as to, I mean, your, your first million dollar deal, I mean, you, you talked about how it's almost the same effort you take to close like a large deal, that like you take to close a small deal. So I, I'm, I'm just curious as to your first million dollar deal, how did that come together? Right, and in terms of just like how long it took you to close that deal, um, from a timeline perspective, how long did that take? Okay, good question. Um, I remember that deal very well. Then dollar was about one fifty something. Um, it it started out. I think the project we the, our big break project was a project with um, a EMTS, um, Etisola now Nine Mobile, and I remember very well because. Um, our first ever project with that company was about maybe 1.6 million to help them with some solution for um, printing statements, automating and formatting their statements for postpaid subscribers. Um, and we started out with that. The second project was about maybe 7 million. Then the last third project was about 60 million. And we kept on proving ourselves. And there was now an opportunity for them to build a big data warehouse and the throughout an RFP. Um, and because we were very, very nimble and close to that client, in the sense that I probably used to walk out from their office those days. Kazim used to probably walk out from their office those days because we we're doing a lot of work for them in different areas. So they had a choice of going with a company that was that we know we can hold, that they know we, we know it's Olumide here, we know it's Kazim here, we see them every day. We can hold these people, we know they would deliver, and they've delivered before. So it's almost like you've been trusted with little things, and now we're going to trust you with this, with this big one. So we, I think getting to that uh, million dollar point was doing several small things very, very well, and then building out that reputation to then be able to jump into the big league. And it's very funny that once you jump into that big league, it's almost like every, everything changes. You now, you, now, you now have that confidence to, to go for more. You now have that reference site to, um, and people then trust you more to be able to to be able to jump into those those kind of those kind of opportunities. Yeah, so it may, may, make, makes a whole lot of sense. And just from from a, from an operational part, how, how do you manage being in five African countries? Right, I know you had, you, had, you had mentioned you have local partners that sort of like have skin in the game, which I assume maybe there's some sort of equity, right? There. Oh. But for, for I'm curious as to how you manage being in multiple countries from a, from a regulation standpoint, from just also an employee management standpoint. Um, and how would this work for a product-based company? I mean, I mean, I see that you put a service, so it might be easier to front, you know, with a different organization or partner with a different organization. If I was a purely product-based company, how would you advise, you know, expand across um, different countries? Yeah, so even Blue Chip, we're, um, we're transitioning. Uh, we already even have some new products on, on, in the market. So taking some of our learnings from services and our IP and productizing that, what you find with product companies is that you have an ability to even be in many more places um, than even services companies. Uh, with product-based companies, um, partnerships and alliances are very, very important, right? So um, how do you find the right partners in those markets to represent you while you are not there? Not necessarily even you setting up base in those markets. In situations where you choose to set up a base in that market, um, finding, like I said, that local partner who has skin in the game is very, is very important. And have that company to be seen as local um, is, also, is, also, um, very, is also very important. In terms of management and engagement, 
You also have to understand some of the cultural differences. There are many times, um, even our guys in our guys in Kenya would feel like that we are too pushy, right? Uh, that hey, these Nigerians are Nigerians just want things done um, now, 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 and trying to understand that aggression and managing managing that culture, right? Um, could be a difficult thing because it's not the same way um, your guys locally might deal with pressure. The guys outside Nigeria might deal with the same thing. So you find some cultural differences in there. Um, and that's why I said having a local player with skin in the game helps you understand that. And um, it, helps in, it helps in also even in engaging with customers. Great. Um, and, and, and I just also want to double down. Um, after this question, I'll probably just go to the Q&A. I see we have 22 questions, right? So uh, I guess we just have to, you know, dig deep into that real quick. But just to double down on some of your thoughts around kickbacks. I mean, we've had oral stories in Nigeria, right, where you're trying to do deals, certain people are asking for certain percentages and things like that. At what, I mean, I'm curious, I, I mean, I know you, you mentioned souvenirs, but I found it hard to believe when you mentioned souvenirs that that <laughs> would work because I'm like, I'm like, really, what's the value of the souvenir I'm going to give anybody, right? Um, um, how do you, I mean, how do you ethically, you know, big compensation for key stakeholders into the organizations? Or, or is there an ethical way to actually bake in compensation for people that are able to, you know, get you through the door and help you? Um, get deals, um, um, get deals done. Is that an ethical way for you to bake in their compensation into that? I've seen certain deals where people would say, um, say for instance, I was a I was a power remitting company, for instance, they'll say on each cost on each sale, you have to give me a kickback of ten naira or five naira, things like that. I mean, are things like that ethical, right? And how, if they're not, like, what's the best way to approach compensating key stakeholders that can either make or mar your deal within organizations? Okay, I think the answer to that question is how long do you want to be around for? Um, if you're if you are coming if you are creating a company that's going to that's going to will and deal its way, um, go, if you go ahead and do that, you you it will only end it will end up in tears at some point. Um, so for me, it's um, there is no ethical way to do it, especially when you even work with multinationals, right? So blue chip, for example. Um, Work or you're even a venture-backed company, any inkling or any suggestion of that, um, of such practices, and, and you're out. So for me, the only way to do it um, in terms of working with people um, is not even, is not even um, um, if someone, if you have someone like a partner, for example, you're trying, you have a solution, and somebody has, somebody, another company has the relationships in the account, I talked about collaboration, then you can collaborate, but then you also have to be sure that the person you are collaborating with is not is not um, compromised um, by by the same by a client that you are also going to meet. So, for example, you find out that maybe the CEO the CEO of a bank or the CEO of NMPC son has a company and he wants you to then bring a solution to to um, to bid together. Um, all of a sudden, you're already working on a very, very fine line of, especially, like I said, if you're working and you represent multinationals, those kind of things are frowned upon. So for me, it's where you don't have the right relationships so or where you are not existing in the account, you can collaborate with people to close. Um, and then if you, are, if you are there for the short term, you will and deal and you find yourself in trouble at the end. So the best thing is you walk away where, where such things happen. There are many ethical organizations in Nigeria Especially in the private sector and even in some public sector accounts, many people might not believe it um, as much, but they actually, there are some banks today in Nigeria that I can beat my chest and say, these guys would never collect one cover from anyone. And many of our customers that we work with are that way. Have you, have you ever had to walk away from a major deal based on the fact that I know we need to deal? Have I been able to work, sorry? Have you ever had to walk away from a major deal um, just because we're not willing to deal with the organization or deal with major stakeholders there? I mean, before it gets to that point, even I've run, I've run, I've run away from, from, such, from such instances because you can already tell, you can already tell certain tell sales signs when someone is calling you on WhatsApp instead of, you, instead of calling you on your normal call. You already know that this person is a dodgy person, so you need to run away. 
Ah, so that's the tell still sign, eh? <laughs> I never knew that. So all, 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 all those funny people that are coming on WhatsApp are like, you know, I'm just, just going to note that down. Um, so yeah, thanks, Olumide. I'm just going to dive right into some of the questions, um, just so we no. can take as, as many questions as possible. Um, there's somebody that has committed your pardonable sin that just asked uh, if you had any parting words. I, I guess that person is probably <laughs> it's just it's just messing around with you, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so I'm going to take a question from Kyrie here, Kyrie Yusuf, um, and he has two questions. Uh, the first question is. Um, Hi, Olivia, for your company, where was the turning point from doing 350K deals to doing multi-million dollar deals? And the second question is, are you still doing the business you started with or did you diversify? If yes, was this diversification intended from the start or it came along the way? Very good questions. Um, I think I addressed the first one in the sense of the turning point. The turning point was doing several small deals and then I talked about the Nine Mobile example and how we transitioned into doing several big deals with them later on. Um, so doing very small things very well um, gave us the, the, the leg to stand on to be able to do bigger deals. Um, in terms of the business we started with, it's a good question because we actually first started out as a vendor neutral um, consulting house. So we never used to pitch any OEM. We just used to recommend OEMs based on any based on what we thought the client was looking for. So a client might say, I'm a Microsoft shop, we'll build a data warehouse using, then we'll build a data warehouse using Microsoft. Or we'll say, the client might say, we are, we are free, recommend anything. And most times then we used to recommend Oracle. And then Oracle said, hey, you guys always recommend us. Why don't you become partners and we sell our own products too? So yes, it changed in the sense that our plan was never to resell those products. But then when the opportunity came, we took it. Those same clients then started saying, why don't you provide us the infrastructure? Because if you find out that many times when you sell an application to a customer, the customer gets hardware from someone else. When there's a problem, the hardware guy is blaming the software guy, the software guy is blaming the hardware guy, and then the customer just wants one neck to choke. So we started also offering, offering infrastructure services alongside um, the key applications we were offering. So it didn't, um, it didn't start out that way. But then we were able to see those opportunities as we started. And most times, that's what it would be. That's why sometimes when I see business plans um, with projections and so on, it, it's really different. It, it, it doesn't really hold water, right? They say the best work of fiction is in Excel because many times it doesn't, it doesn't turn out that way. But being able to find those opportunities um, once you start, I think that's, that's the real hard work. Got it. Um, and then there's a question here from um, Shion Awoyele, uh, Awoyele, sorry. He says, um, what is often ignored but important when trying to expand your services for Pan-African coverage? That's the first question. And the second question is, enterprise service deal flow in this part is mostly on a need to know basis. Any advice on how one can break into the segment and meet key decision makers? Okay, so the first one is, what is often ignored, but important when trying to expand your services Pan-African? Okay, what is often ignored is thinking you can do it yourself. I think you can replicate that success um, because you've done it locally um, in your own country. Um, so that's why I said, finding local partners and key local partners. We've had local partners before that have been from hell um, because the guy talked, he talked all the good things. Uh, you went in bed and you found out that this guy, this guy didn't even, didn't even know it's left from right. So finding the right partner um, who you then make sure, and like a bad example, didn't have skin in the game. We funded everything. Um, he was just there based on the fact that he was local and he got some sweat equity. Finding local partners who have things to lose. Either he has taken a pay cut to join you or he has put his own money also into, into that venture. We make sure that the person um, gives, it, gives it his right focus. So thinking you can do it alone would be would be very very wrong. Great. Um, so I guess the, the 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 key point to note there is to always look for people with similar interests you can collaborate with in this new market you're you're going into. Um, so so I'm curious, Olumide, from from a cultural perspective, what what differences have you have you noted in terms of selling to Nigerians and selling to people in other African countries? Um, again, I I, I totally. 
agree with some some of the reservations people have about i mean not agree but like i see those reservations like people think nigerians are brash you know when you go to the african yeah. country i mean i was sitting somewhere without saying two words in nairobi somebody walked up to me and said you are nigerian and i'm like <laughs> i literally have not said anything like you i was just not, not <laughs> <in the room. laughs> right so so what differences have you seen in terms of just selling to to enterprises in nigeria and in these other countries you operate are there cultural nuances so you had mentioned in nigeria you greet gate men i saw somewhere in your slide where somebody was frustrating you know um I, what are the differences you see in terms of like how you sell to nigerian companies and how you sell to other companies in african other african countries i think it's also it's more it's more about knowing the personality of the of the kind of people you are going to sell to right um there are some folks today where you are going to a meeting and then you are wearing the next the best the best rolex watch you have in your in your in your collection and then certain people might look at it in a way and say hey this guy is a okay this guy is is a correct guy or is a he's he's well to do he's not going to run away with my money someone else might say it and say this person is show off it right so finding conservative and you find out that many people outside our country are, are very conservative um finding that a conservative approach um to selling to them um uh, makes makes it easier i'll put it i'll put it that way um so you're not over the top in their in their face um i find out that um that might work in nigeria but doesn't necessarily work outside so they are more conservative outside um the the guy the guy in east africa is is telling you at 5 30 he's home he's wondering why you're calling him at 7 30 or 8 p.m so understanding those kind of things are also very important Great. Um, um, and there's a question from um, Ife Odiete. His question is, how do you handle local partnership in African countries? Um, example, when they see the size of a deal, do they want to hijack it or take a longer, a larger pie than you initially agreed? How do you protect your business from being hijacked by a local partner? Um, so I think um, it, it comes again, like I said, I, I mentioned a bad example we've had, right? With someone who didn't have skin, with someone who didn't have skin in the game. Um, I think for me also, it's when you find that local partner and you think about it from a way, from a point of view of, if there was no agreement in place, would I still work with this person? That's the first question you need to ask yourself. Obviously, you're going to put agreements in place, but you should ask yourself the question, the hypothetical question to say, if there is no agreement in place, can I still work with this person? If the answer is yes, um, then you need to protect yourself with obviously with the right contracts and so on. And like I said, making sure the guy has skin in the game will make sure he's not, he doesn't do anything, anything stupid. Um, and then obviously we also found lawyers in those regions. So we found local lawyers who, who even um, draft the right agreements for us, who even represent us in those, in certain, in certain meetings when you can't, when you can't attend. So having a go-to guy, right, is very, very important. If you don't have a go-to guy, um, you would, you could be yes, as this kind of things could happen. Great. Um, and there's a question here from um, Olali Kolude. He says, uh, please give us, please take us through some of your back-end modus operandi on how you open up a relationship and what happens after your first presentation. Experience would be helpful. So I'm guessing the question here is to share your experience on how you basically um, open up relationships in in new country and in new countries rather, um, and how what happens after your first presentation, more like a like a playbook, like a walkthrough. Okay, so the first thing is is who do we know together? Who do I know? Who do we have? Which mutual friends do we have first? That's what I try and map. So I try and do their influence. It's called the influence mapping to say um, who do, who does Olumide know in this account? Who does Kazim know in this account? Um, or who do I say, well, like you're talking about, who do the key salespeople know in this account that are influential? That person doesn't necessarily have to be the key person you're selling to, but it's someone who can speak for you. Um, once we do that and we've um, been able to get that intro and you've had that first, that first presentation, um, the second step obviously is, okay, it's twofold actually. There are some instances that is RFP led, right? In when I mean I request for proposal led, which you'll find most times in the enterprise space. 
Um, there are other instances where you are the one building out the opportunity. So the client has not necessarily seen that he has this need, but you have, you have seen it from the outside looking in, and then you have seen an opportunity. So presenting the opportunity and trying to get buying, I can usually tell if I'm going to close a deal in the first five minutes of, of engaging a customer, um, because you're, the customer is the one asking you what's happening next before you even, before you even broach that question. So finding out, um, finding out who are the key people that you know, or the mutual interests, um, the mutual people that you guys know, you and the key person you're selling to. And after the presentation, circling back with that person um, to, to get a feedback on what the guy thought about the presentation you guys just made and what the guy thinks about you and so on. And then um, the second point is, okay, how do I then build, build a relationship build a relationship with this, with this guy. And I found out that many times, nobody likes to be, to be seen that they are being patronized or they are being sold to in an overtly way, right? So it's ways where you are, you are, you are finding common interests, like I mentioned, you're finding out some things he likes um, in terms of, um, like I said, it could be a crypto head and you're sending him relevant information, trying to build that personal relationship first with that person. Um, and then it puts you in a position where you are then able to draw closer to, to the person to be able to close. So for me, I find out that many people that we've done business with, we've also developed some form of relationship as a trusted advisor. So there are some many clients today who, before they even buy anything, even though it's not things that we are necessarily selling, they come and talk to us to say, Olumide, what do you think about this person? Or what do you think about this product? So being seen as a trusted advisor, the clients would always come back to you. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that's, that's pretty useful um, to note. Um, there's a question from Precious. If this was your day one, how would you go about, you know, um, selling to enterprise? Uh, how do you get people to refer you since a lot of enterprise selling is done through referrals? As you made this was your day one, you had no connections, you had no contact, you had no reputation in the industry. Yes. So this, I think I mentioned it when I talked about the CFS West Africa example, and it was it's about referring to your own personal your own personal reference and attributing that to the company. So you have to be careful with the wordings. Like like I said, you don't have any reference sites in GT Bank, for example. But you, as a consultant, you develop the same application for GT Bank while you work there. So you refer to things like X Y Z consultants have worked on so, 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 and so projects in the past. So yes, the company doesn't have the reference, but the consultants that are delivering this do have that reference. It does help. So you, the bet is on the personal reference, on the personal reference of, of the people, of the, of the promoters of the company. So that's what you need to showcase. And, and there's this interesting question here around how do you accelerate um, um, closing a deal. So there's a question from Kunle Ginodo. We have, we have a B2B to C product and have had some good requests just before the pandemic. Looks like decision making is slower now. Are you experiencing this? How do you close deals faster, especially if this tool is something that is valuable when people are in the office? Hmm. Um, so I found out that in the initial stage of the pandemic, it was almost like everybody, everybody just pressed stop. Like, okay, stop, nothing is happening anymore. This is it, budgets are closed. If I were getting emails already, everybody have your, have, have your, have your current contracts with us by 20%. There was that initial, initial reaction. Um, but then that, that sort of cooled down maybe in around May, June, July, or May, June, and everybody realized, hey, we are going to be living, we are going to be living with this thing. Um, our numbers are still going to, are still in terms of some of the enterprise clients, we are still going to be able to, to weather this and still going to be able to take on some of these projects. So that, that then brought some projects back, back on the front burner. Um, I find out that, that, deals, that are, deals that are going to close um, quickly, you, would, you can quickly tell from the, from the feedback and the momentum in, within the client space, right? How quickly are they? How quickly are they responding to, to certain requests that you've made? Um, who are the key decision makers in there? Who are you talking to? So for example, I give an example of maybe, and I talk, when, sales, when I talk to my salespeople and they say things like, hey, I'm talking, yes, I'm talking to, 
I'm talking to ex to Mr. Lagbaja in or Mr. Lagbaja in, in GC Bank, and then they report to you during your sales meeting saying engaging with GC Bank. To me, that's nothing, right? Because if someone comes to my office and meets the guy at the door, his name is Toib, and gives Toib his proposal, he can say he's engaging with Toib. But who are you really engaging with? And who is giving you key? Who is giving who is your guide? So you always have to have a guide within within the organization who gives you the pulse, who lets you know the pulse of the organization regarding what you are selling. And with that, you are able to focus and commit those deals um, appropriately. So you need to feel the pulse of the deal. That's what I'm saying. And on average, Olumide, in terms of opening up new countries, how long does it typically take you for you to scout a country out and figure out, you know, okay, we want to be in this market. Yes, let's open it. From, from the time you're, you, you take interest in the, in the country to the time you become operational, how long does it take? So like, you know, I mentioned that some, some, of, some deals or some opportunities or some expansion um, initiatives have been opportunistic, right? Yeah. Some of them you've the deal has already closed with one client. So it's, it's um, you already have a cost, you have customer 001 already. And so maybe you're you you are, you are delivering some services for a telco in that region. So once you have started out with that service, um, you then find out that, okay, this same service that um, this telco needs, telco B also needs the same thing. And you can then build around your team, your team in that, your team in that region. So it, many times, like I said, in those cases, it's opportunistic. So those ones move quicker. But when it's strategic, um, that requires even you funding out of pocket um, first, in terms of there's no customer, there's no, um, you need to create that runway before you can, before you can start getting to cash. Um, obviously, it takes more time. Like, for example, in Kenya, I started going to Kenya in 20, in last year was 2019 so in october of 2018 or october november of 2018 i went there for the first time i went there again probably in february of 2019 and then we incorporated sometime in in august and we launched fully in october of 2019 so it took a while because like i said we we're exploring the market be sure that we are going to commit money from hq to this market and finding the right local partner who would have skin in the game also Great. Um, and, and there's a question here, which I guess you've 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 spoken to, um, um, or you've you've mentioned in passing. There's a question on how you've been able to manage um, the partnership you have across Africa due to the COVID pandemic. I guess based based on the restrictions in, in travel, um, and seeing that some of these relationships are, are are very interpersonal and physically based, you have to you know. You mentioned go for people's birthdays, people parties, and things like that. How have you been able to manage um, these relationships during this period um, due to the travel restrictions? Yeah, so like it's still the same part around constant communication, right? And sharing different sharing different things or encouraging each other. I mean, I know how many messages I sent out during the heat of the lockdown, right? Showing people real empathy. That hey, how are you doing? How are you keeping up? How are you how are you staying well? Um, during this period. Um, I, I, I actually remember everyone who checked on me during that period. I can also, and I'm sure those people I checked on would also remember. So um, showing empathy is really the right thing. You could, it's the only thing you could have given during that period. Great. Um, and there's a question here from an anonymous attendee. Um, it says, I have delivered a service to a large, a large corporate. The company is fine with my work. However, the procurement manager is on my neck for something for Christmas. How do I handle this di dilemma? You said procurement manager is sending me, send me a hamper now. <laughs> <laughs> if, your policy, if the policy allows, send him a hamper. But you see, the thing is, the, the day you give that procurement manager something, everybody else is coming after you, right? So you need to be very, very careful. Mm. Okay, great. Um, and there's a question here from Avery Thomas Moore. She says, uh, as technology becomes even more fundamental to the operations of more businesses, how do you approach educating your clients and what kinds of products have you developed specifically to serve African markets beyond Oracle's offering? Very good question. Um, 
what we found, right, and you find especially learning from so many of the enterprise companies that were maybe reselling OEMs products, it's very lucrative in the sense that you can do a $2 million deal and um, you have a 5%, 10% margin, boom, you are sitting on 100K, 200K, right? Um, because it's, it's, one, it's, a one, it's a one-off deal and it's quick, it's quick revenue. Um, but it's not sustainable because you're just, you're really just an invoice pusher in those cases. Uh, where, we've, where we've differentiated ourselves is building some key, so, some key IP around, for example, um, data models for understanding customer churn um, within our local context or building out several models that are based on um, banking here or that are based on how um, low value customers engage with the telco. So you, when you build out those solutions, in fact, um, for a long time, we had the OEMs going to market for us because the OEMs needed to sell and then they needed someone who had the right offering. So the OEMs would also pack, would also position you because they know that without, <clears throat> without some of your intellectual property, their Oracle solutions um, as dumb as they can be because they don't have anything to lay eyes on. Or without your technical expertise, the client can't do anything with their software. So being able to offer that extra value add um, around your intellectual property and local nuance obviously differentiates you from just an invoice pusher. Great. Um, and there's a question here from Abayomi. It says, uh, we're a software development company and we are looking for partnerships in Nigeria. We have developed some healthcare, international health passports and few others. How do we approach it? We are from Barbados. So I guess the question is, they're looking for <laughs> oh, email. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Um, so, and, and I guess, I mean, a bunch of questions here around, you know, can people have access to your email? So, I mean, is that something you're happy to share on this call? Yes, uh, yes I am. Because I can see, I can see so many questions here. I have at the top and unanswered here. Should we still address them? Do we stay outside? We have about 20 more minutes. Um, so I guess we can, uh, we, it, it's, it's definitely, we, we, we definitely can answer all the questions. I think there's still about, 40 or 30 unanswered questions. Um, wow. uh, but what I'm doing is I'm basically just looking for similar questions and grouping them together or I'm just okay. answering them and you know, that hopefully covers for, but for the questions we can answer, I, I guess we can, we can send them to you. And if you, if you want to answer them, we, we can, we can put answers together and ship it off to the, to the attendants. But I guess we can take a few, a few more questions before we run out of time. Um, but yeah, if you want to share your email, please share so people, so I can, I mean, there are people here, there, there are a bunch of questions around, do you mentor people, can they have access to your email, somebody wants to meet, yeah. uh, so I, I guess you, you, you can, they can take that conversation up with you via email. Sure, you can put my email, I'll put my email in the chat room now. Okay, great. Um, so for everybody that wants to speak to Lumi Day, that's reaching out for partnership, mentorship, there's a question there on funding, please send Lumi Day an email. Yeah, so there's, there's a question around, um, and I think this is really important. How do you go about building a sales um, workforce in your organization? How do you build it? How do you build? I mean, it seems like you have figured out the, the selling part. Like you, have a, like you have a sales machine that just goes out there and just clo clo close deal. How do you go about building that? I think um, it's finding the right personalities um, within and the right mix. Um, within the organization. So like I said, um, they are the hunters and they are the farmers, right? They are the guys who, who are out there every day, who are, who, who are considered like myself, who are building out that network. But then they are the people who also are more long-term, more customer focused and do more of the customer service. So it's the business development, the sort of account management, um, 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 partnership. How do you how do you marry the two? So what I what I what I look for right is a mix is a mix of those kind of people. I find out that the the organized guys who like the paperwork, guys who like those follow ups and emails, who would follow up on a deal, right? Um, are the typical and who follow up on a customer are the typical are the typical farmer types. You find out that the the hunter types would also go after the very large ticket transactions. And then they would hold that client 
and they will map that client so much that they become that client's guy and that client's go-to guy on anything. Um, and then they build that personal relationship with the client. So finding a mix of both personalities um, also works. Um, sometimes you also have to balance, and it's, it's very it's strange that we have to say it, you have to have, but you have to balance ethnicity even in your sales organization. Um, and because you find out that many Nigerians react that way to it, whether you like it or not. So balancing ethnicity too is even very important. And inclusion. Great. Um, and there's this question here around um, what, I, I know you've spoken to this, but hopefully you can share a few, maybe, maybe a few tips that could help this person. The person says, what's the average lead time from initial contact to closing a deal, signing? It seems like it takes forever in Nigeria. It does. And if you've done, if you do public sector, it even takes forever. It even takes longer than forever. Um, you had deals take over two and a half years to close before in the public sector. Um, I think there's really no average time because um, sometimes you even get requests for proposals from customers, and you see in those requests for proposal, they've set out dates for the opening of the bid, they set out dates for evaluation, they set out dates for, for award. I can't remember any of those bids that we've gone for where those things have, have happened have happened that way. Um, so the best the the best thing you could do, like I said, is having having a key a key guide, or I call them a, a coach within the organization who can give you, who can let you know the pulse, the pulse of every deal, right? Because there's nothing a salesman hates not than not being able to 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 forecast and commit a deal. So the the best approach is building a a huge, obviously a huge pipeline, um, because many of those deals would, would not happen, um, such that when the ones that happen for you, um, when the others have dropped, it's still sizable enough for you to meet your number. Great, um, and let, let, let's just switch things up a little bit. There's an interesting question here, which is quite different from all the other questions here. Um, this question is around ESOP, and the question is from Angela Mukami. Do you believe in employee stock option plan? as a way of building and retaining top talent when you were expanding to other African markets? <laughs> Angela, I just, it's, it's not, it's not <laughs> <an employee>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good question, Angela. Yes, we do to key hires. Um, like I said, even locally in all the, all the entities we have locally, the local partners we have um, are, have equity in the business. And then obviously, you also have to be careful with who, um, who you've created such, um, such, um, such options for. Um, so you have to find key, key guys. I know what I, what I always tell everyone, right, and I tell people is there are some key people within our organization today that I can't even, that I can't even just afford to think about them leaving, right? So how do you tie those people, even not from the employee side, even you selfishly, from your own selfish point of view, how do you tie those people? And it's, I, giving them different, um, giving creating this kind of equity in 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 that business to to tie them to tie them in yes, so it's something we consider. But obviously, we don't have a, in those markets is not is not available to all because of the high level of turnover in in um in the enterprise sales market. Uh, great, and there's this there's this question from um, Adiola. Um, what can you? What can you identify? I'm just going to paraphrase. I guess the question is, uh, can you identify a key failure you've, that you've had and learned a valuable lesson from while dealing with early clients? I think assuming that, assuming that um, you have everything in the bag, right? You know, there are some customers that you've, like I said, there are some customers where you don't even, you don't even, you don't, you don't even know, you don't even have to sign a logbook when you are going in, right? Because Everybody knows you within that base, right? You, you built. You're almost like a staff. When you drive into the customer's compound, they even open the door for you because you've built that relationship in that account and you've become part and parcel of that account. Um, I think it's very, very important not to, um, not to assume and get carried away with, with, with that confidence that um, you would, you would close, you would close any, you would close all your deals in that account because you have it, you have it on lock. 
Um, so there are some times where overconfidence has, has led to us losing one or two deals before. Great. Um, and there's this interesting question from Femi Aluko. He says, um, when you say these Nigerians have come again, are you suggesting we have a bad reputation in Africa too? If yes, how did you build your trust? Very good. I saw a WhatsApp forward that was even going around, that was going around recently when um, one of the banks in Nigeria acquired the, a, a Kenyan bank. And there was this WhatsApp forward about, hey, the Nigerians have come for the banks. They've come for our women. They are coming for everything. They are coming for everything that <laughs> that we have that is good, that is good in that is good in our country. And um, is that is that is that stereotype um, of um, they are come they are coming to take they are coming to take our lunch um, as opposed to we are coming to build something out together to eat well together. So for me, it's, it's very that's why I said it's very very important that. You're, you're seen as a local company. Um, because if you think about it, even in Nigeria, right, um, we have some of those sentiments amongst some other nationalities when you say, ah, these guys who are here, or these guys are coming to this market. Many people also, also have those kind of sentiments. So every company is still going to push some of its local agenda. So why not align with it anyway? Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, that, I, think, that, I think that's great feedback. Um, um, and there is this question from Ty, I guess this is a personal problem they're having, um, it needs your thought on it. So we have a, we have a networking platform that is user-based and onboarding is as simple as Facebook sign up. We found a few Ghanaian users onboarded. Should we go all out, need for a local partner necessary? I guess the question, should they go all out and just do this by themselves and onboard Ghanaian? the Ghanaian users and probably double down on the Ghanaian market, or should they source for a local partner? I'm not too sure. It's very difficult for me to answer that one without having more context on, on what he's really trying to do. Fair enough. So maybe you so, can reach out to me. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, I, I posted um, Olumide's email within the chat, so please um, feel free to reach out to Olumide directly. Um, there's this question from Laulu that says, how do I identify a good partner and what are the best approach to bring them in? Um, I think finding a good partner, and I, I think I wrote something about it, that finding a co-founder is like getting married. Um, it's still the same things that you look for in your, in your, in your wife, <laughs> in the sense of, do you trust this person? Um, are, you, are, you going to be, are you guys going to be open to each other? How does this person handle money? Um, certain key, certain key, um, key things you would look for, um, and can you even work for this person? So have some of the key, key things that you might want to ask yourself. And then in terms of recruiting or getting someone to believe in your dream, remember you started out as your own dream and you're trying to get someone to buy into it. Um, so you're able, you are first able to convince this person and you are going to think about, you have to think about what's in need for this person. Um, so the person too has to has to see the upside in terms of um, an equity stake in the company, in terms of what the person has to gain if it all works out very well. And um, so selling that dream um, to to a person, and if you're able to convince that person, I think you are well on your way to success. Okay, great. Um, and and there's a question here around how do you manage your relationships with OEMs? I think OEM relationships are very, very important because, um, like I said, sometimes you, you are reselling OEMs products, and what we found has worked very, very well for us is, is openness. Um, many of the OEMs um, who report to the report to their different headquarters, the worst thing they hate is not being able to forecast and and commit a deal, right? So because some of these guys are publicly listed, and um, they they have to forecast revenue. So when you forecast when you as a local partner, you're forecasting wrongly to them, um, it, it doesn't help them. So being open about where deals are, and you find out that they don't get that as much from many partners. Being open, being trustworthy, your 30 days for payment is 30 days for payment. Many of the OEMs in Nigeria today are stuck with a lot of bad debt because many customers or many partners have taken money and not even paid the OEMs. So um, being, a, being credible, um, is very, very important. You find out that many of the OEMs are even the ones saying, 
hey, why don't you come and look at this market? It's a very interesting market also. Because they know that you make their work easier by being able to deliver, as you said you would, and then keep up to your financial obligations. Uh, so I mean I think that that is that's that's that, that's super important. Um, there's a question from Bola Lawal. Um, he says, "Can you talk about client alignment and industry mix, specifically on SaaS? Is there a reason why you only focus on banks and telcos? Merit to being this focused?" So the truth is, with kind of solutions we sell, right? It's almost that if it's not about large money, what's the point? The banks and telcos are the people who can spend two, three million dollars on a, or a hundred thousand dollars monthly, or even fifty thousand dollars monthly on a product, right? And so it's it's finding it's finding those two, three clients. I mentioned I mentioned earlier that even as of today, sixty, seventy percent of our revenue will probably come from five or six customers. So finding those key customers and then targeting those, those large ticket solutions to those customers is what we've done, is what we've, we've been able to do successfully. Another person might say, hey, I'm going to look at the SME market with the SaaS offering, for example, instead of showing out these servers, instead of bringing out the whole servers and, and showing out this annual CapEx budget to a customer, I might decide to build out a SaaS offering and go, for, go after a mid-tier, low-tier SME market. And they might be successful in doing that. So it's and they will be able to build more volume because there are more of those companies. So it depends on the approach you want to you want to take. But I find out that is usually either or because you find many companies doing one side very very well and not doing the other side well. So so for you in this case was was more of what what where where where's the where, where's the bigger opportunity right? Who are the people that can provide you with the sort of check size that make this what what your time? Yep, and and you can focus on that narrow base. Another person can decide to to work out with to go and decide to service maybe two hundred microfinance banks, right? I might decide to service only two tier commercial banks and make the same number. Fair enough. Um, there's a question from Tega, um, and the question is for enterprise products that do um, Amazon month on month, not contractual revenue. How does the entire philosophy apply? How does the what? Onta philosophy. You know, you alluded to the farm and onta philosophy initially. So I'm assuming if you are doing month on month revenue, um, you have you have an you have a, you have a yearly contract. So I'm thinking that uh, it's probably a cloud offering. The person has has sold has sold to the customer, and the customer is paying is paying monthly. So the the whole idea is to lock is to find it is to find lock in right. How do you find lock in opportunities? Um, within those contracts that make that make it sticky for that customer. So, for example, you've you've built out a product where um, the user interface is what your customers customers are used to, um, and you are keeping and your your platform is the one that provides that, creating a huge switching cost for the customer um, to leave your to leave your product keeps you tied in. So, it's breaking all that in right from the beginning um, is what you then need to look at. Great. Um, we have 10 more minutes. Um, so I'm just going to take two more. And, and I see that I'm really drinking lots of water. It's, it's a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's, it's been pretty engaging and, and super useful. Um, if, for me also, I've been taking notes while you have been talking, right? Um, and the people have WhatsApp me to say that definitely they want the recording. So yeah, for everybody that's on the, on the webinar, we're going to share the recording. Um, so um, no, no worries there. I'm just going to ask a few more, two more questions, and then we can wrap this up. Um, you have Olumide's email. If you need, uh, if you need to reach out to him, please feel free to shoot him an email. Um, so Olumide, just two more questions, um, and then I guess we can call this a day. Um, for companies looking to expand regionally, I know you, you, you have shared some insights. Top, top of head, what are the top three things you'll tell them to focus on? Um, finding the right local partner again is the, will be the first will be the first thing, um, and um, be ready to unlearn certain things, certain things um, from Nigeria because it probably won't work. It probably won't work that way. 
Um, so trying to, do, you have to learn to do some of the some of the things differently and adapt to that market. So for example, I found out that in Kenya, um, people are ready to pay more for services than in Nigeria. So in Nigeria, there's a tendency to say, uh, is it not Kyode that I know that you want to build that you want to bill out for one thousand dollars a day? Kyode that I know, Kyode that I know here. Um, but in Kenya, they are ready to pay top tier for for good for good resources and and for for um, for talent. So um, finding on learning certain things and baking that into your baking that into your operations um, would be important. And finding the right local partner will also be important. And then um, also know when to walk away. Right? You must have you must be able to you may be able to be in a position where you can say hey. Fuck it, it's not working. I'm I'm done, <laughs> and so knowing when to walk away is also important. And just from a from a from a going aggressive and competition standpoint, how how do you when, when you enter new markets and there's an entrenched player, how do you go about you know competing in such markets? So in in those places, you have to you have to let your shit bubble quietly, and then and then you and then you blow because you. It's you can't you can't come out brash and and say hey yeah you're here then we are ready to we are ready to take your launch it's 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 only a recipe for disaster so it's for me it's it's building out slowly and building out sustainably um, that um, that matters so it's finding the right like I said finding even the right people to collaborate with um, within the organization hiring right is very also. <clears throat> Is also very important. Once you're able to hire the right people, I think it changes. It changes how it makes your life easier in those markets. Great. Um. Thank you so much, Olumide. Um. Just before we wrap the call, I mean, I guess I'll just ask you a bunch of fun questions just so we get to know you a little better. I mean, you had mentioned that you're a member of a polo club, right? So I know you like FIFA. I just I mean, you tweet a lot about, <laughs> <laughs> about FIFA, right? So, so I'm curious as to, I mean, aside work, um, what else do you enjoy doing? Aside, of course, being a member of the Polo Club and also playing FIFA, um, what else do you enjoy doing? Um, traveling, yeah, I enjoy traveling. <clears throat> I enjoy traveling and passing, yeah. Yeah, and, and in terms of books, um, what, what book has had the most influence on your life? What has the most influence on my life? Let me see, because I have, I have, um, I'm not sure about influence in my life, but in terms <laughs> of, <laughs> in terms of, um, that made me see things, that made me see some problems I was facing at the time differently. Um, Antifragile by Taleb was, was a, is a book I, is a book I, that changed my perspective, that changed my perspective on, on, on many things. Yes, yeah, so I think that's the first thing that, that comes to my mind. And for companies looking to sell to enterprise or looking to expand regionally, what book would you recommend? I didn't read any book to expand. So um, it's, I think everybody needs to create its own, create your own playbook, right? You need to, you need to find what works, what works for you. And, um, and I find out that reaching out to people who have done it before, like we are doing it right now, are, are some of the most effective ways to, um, to do that. Um, not many things you read in a textbook, can you? Great. Many of you uh, shared today won't you won't read in a textbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very, very true. I mean, we wouldn't see that that text message from the bouncer sending you <laughs> messages every week. <laughs> you know, so thank you so much, Olimide. Um, it's been great having you. Um, and I'm sure I mean the 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 feedback also has been has been has been really, really good. Um and I'm sure founders have found this really useful. I mean, I looked through the, the call log and I could identify about 30% of the people on the call thereabouts, and about the, most of them are actually founders. So, uh, so, uh, so I guess um, this has been super useful. Again, once again, if you need to reach out to Lumide, um, his email is within the chat. On Twitter, I think his handle is at Otumba Show. I guess. All right. Yes. Uh, and so I guess you can also reach out to him on Twitter, follow him on Twitter, and also follow the VP handle on Twitter um, 
for more updates. Once again, thanks everyone for joining. We're gonna share. We're gonna share the. We're gonna share the recording um, via emails. Um, so just just look forward to that. And so you can always have something you can always refer to. And I'm sure Olumide is always available to answer um, further questions you, you might have. Um, Olumide, any tips on people that want to contact you via email, uh, just so they're able to they're able to get the best out of you. I mean, maybe you should put um, the VP phone chat on the subject. Okay. And go straight to the point or say, hey. I know, yeah, you know, that one, that one is great. <laughs> if I don't respond in the first 30 minutes, I'm probably not going to respond. <laughs> but I'll try to respond. Fair enough. I respond to every email in 30 minutes. So. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, uh, let me just type my giveaway email right away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Olivier. It was, it was great having you. Um, it was great you. doing this. Thank you a lot. Thank you, thank so you everyone. Much. Bye-bye. Yeah, good day, everyone. So we're just going to play like music for 30 seconds and log everybody off the call. Okay. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Cheers. Yeah.